questo momento così difficile, il momento del Covid, eh, ci ha insegnato una cosa fondamentale, che non possiamo fare a meno del nostro sistema sanitario, non possiamo fare a meno né dei nostri medici né dei nostri infermieri e non possiamo fare a meno dei nostri agricoltori. Hanno dimostrato in questo momento complesso che eh, anche la stabilità del paese, sia sociale che produttiva, è affidata ad un modello produttivo fondato sul, sulla realtà agricola. Eh, questo diciamo, è, stato un, è stata una prova molto importante, eh, superata eh, diciamo in parte perché purtroppo la crisi ancora non è eh, passata, eh, dal mondo agricolo. Poi, in quel contesto sicuramente gli altissimi costi di produzione derivanti non solo dalle difficoltà, dall'impiego di manodopera e da eh, momenti di mercato molto difficili eh, hanno oh, sicuramente eh, necessità di dover eh, costruire un qualcosa di alternativo eh, che ci dia la possibilità eh, di poter eh, migliorare e in volume eh, ma soprattutto in valore. È chiaro, l'Italia ha sicuramente un ruolo importante diciamo, dal punto di vista globale perché è un importatore molto importante di cereali, ma questa cosa non è assolutamente diciamo, sufficiente per dire che va bene così. Viviamo un'annata abbastanza buona, abbiamo gli stock alti, eh, con tutto ciò eh, eh, di fronte ad un mercato eh, agroalimentare che in una prima fase di crisi ha tirato molto, di fatto oggi registriamo una piccola flessione eh, sul consumo, eh, ma eh, il dato sicuramente rilevante è quello che eh, di fronte eh, ad una ehm, autorevolezza e quindi sufficienza rispetto a quelle che sono gli stock e quindi la tranquillità della sovranità eh, alimentare eh, abbiamo dimostrato oh, l'ennesima volta eh, che eh, il mondo cerealicolo e il mondo agricolo è fondamentale per la tenuta di un paese. Eh, sono stati fatti degli interventi, i vari decreti hanno comunque considerato eh, questa situazione, eh, ma eh, non sono ancora sufficienti, Abbiamo, immaginiamo i 40 milioni messi per i contratti di filiera, dobbiamo comunque ancora potenziare la uh, tracciabilità e i sistemi di etichettatura, eh, anche se eh, l'Italia e anche il modello industriale italiano, se non altro quello più evoluto, sta facendo un passo in avanti, riconoscendo comunque un valore eh, non soltanto eh, storico e di racconto, ma anche alla qualità eh, oggettiva del prodotto, eh, facendo degli investimenti mirati eh, su delle filiere eh, importanti come quello eh, cerealicolo. Sicuramente l'educazione alimentare sarà fondamentale, sicuramente i sistemi di trasformazione e le alternative alla vendita tradizionale saranno degli elementi che determineranno dei cambiamenti. Abbiamo cambiato, o meglio stiamo cambiando culturalmente il nostro approccio al mondo del consumo, stiamo cambiando anche quelle che sono diciamo delle, eh, del, dei fondamenti produttivi eh, ai quali siamo eh, abituati e ai quali purtroppo in parte dovremo rinunciare, con questo Roma Cereali vogliamo definire quello che sarà la nuova traiettoria eh, per eh, un futuro sicuramente sano, ricco, perché come mondo agricolo abbiamo una grandissima opportunità, siamo tornati ad essere attualissimi e siamo tornati ad essere un pilastro del Paese. Buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti alla tredicesima edizione di Roma Cereali che realizziamo in questa modalità particolare virtuale determinata dal momento che stiamo vivendo. Attraversiamo una 
crisi senza precedenti per, per ampiezza, praticamente tutti i paesi del mondo sono stati eh, investiti, sia pure con una scansione temporale leggermente diversa eh, e non sappiamo, abbiamo un'incertezza sulla durata e sull'intensità Uh, di, questa, di questa crisi. Uh, la politica economica non ha mai fronteggiato una minaccia di questo tipo e quindi sta cercando di mettere a punto uh, degli strumenti. Qualcuno ha provato a fare dei parallelismi uh, con la crisi del 2007-2008 ma in realtà uh, quella era una crisi finanziaria, in qualche modo gli analisti l'avevano già uh, prefigurata, c'erano dei degli strumenti da poter adottare per contrastarla. Questa veramente, come l'ha definita eh, il premio Nobel dell'economia Stiglitz, è un, uno tsunami. Ehm, in, proprio in questo momento, mai come in questo momento, lo studio, l'analisi dei mercati, che è poi l'obiettivo di Roma Cereali, questa giornata eh, dedicata alla, alla filiera, assume una rilevanza strategica. Eh, per questo la Camera di Commercio che promu di Roma, che promuove eh, l'incontro, che è realizzato da noi, Agrocamera, l'azienda speciale per l'agroalimentare, in collaborazione con Arzia, la agenzia regionale per l'agricoltura per questo motivo abbiamo ritenuto di non mancare questo appuntamento così eh, importante per mantenere il nostro impegno verso la platea di operatori ed imprese che gravitano attorno alla borsa merci di Roma. Roma Cereali è un progetto voluto dalla borsa merci con l'intento di fornire un quadro informativo esauriente per quanto possibile aderente agli effettivi sviluppi di scenario eh, dei mercati. Ci aiutano analisti, tecnici, operatori dei principali e più eh, autorevoli soggetti che operano nel eh, settore e che sono oggi qui insieme a noi per aggiornare i consuntivi e formulare le previsioni nel passaggio da una campagna a quella successiva. Li vedete tutti eh, insieme eh, a me, ve li introduco rapidamente e la prima relazione come sempre sarà quella di Darren Cooper, Senior Economist di International Grain Council che mh, ci guiderà appunto a, in un'analisi eh, globale di quelli che sono i fondamentali e gli andamenti delle commodity a livello mondiale. Proseguiremo poi con eh, le Americhe, l'America del Nord e l'America del Sud Grazie alla presentazione di Ruth Kukuk, direttore marketing regionale di US Wheat Associates. E poi torniamo nel continente europeo con la terza presentazione, sarà quella di Svetlana Sinkowska, direttore marketing di APK Inform. E proseguiremo poi con Martial Guerre eh, che ci presenta la situazione della Francia, un importante partner commerciale eh, per l'Italia. Martial eh, rappresenta qui, è responsabile della promozione nell'Unione Europea per France Export Cereal, che eh, i frequentatori abituali eh, di Roma Cereali conoscono perché organizziamo insieme un altro appuntamento previsto nel pre periodo autunnale proprio dedicato al raccolto eh, francese. E da ultimo, ma certo non meno importante, anzi per noi è, è, è importantissimo il suo intervento perché è tutto dedicato alla situazione, in modo prevalente dedicato alla situazione nazionale, ringrazio Mauro Bruni, presidente eh, di Arete. Allora, un buongiorno e, e un grazie a tutti voi per aver accolto l'invito eh, di Roma Cereali. Eh, iniziamo dunque a, eh, ad analizzare quali possono essere le principali sfide che aspettano il settore eh, cerealicolo eh, nell'immediato futuro. Siamo in un contesto di relativa abbondanza dell'offerta generale, abbiamo questa eh, preoccupazione 
riflessione sull'andamento dei consumi, c'è un aumento eh, costante ormai da qualche anno a questa parte, le tensioni eh, commerciali ehm, con un mercato, l'abbiamo visto, ci eravamo lasciati in occasione della passata edizione di Roma Cereali che viveva le tensioni della guerra commerciale tra Stati Uniti e Cina, oggi fortunatamente guerra superata con l'accordo commerciale eh, che eh, qui è stato dato avvio eh, lo scorso febbraio, ma certo dobbiamo considerare che in una situazione eh, di crisi del multilateralismo e di ehm, opzione di molti paesi di accordi bilaterali la situazione è piuttosto eh, fluida, ehm, le tensioni sono comunque costanti. L'altra grande incognita, l'altro grande tema, lo sappiamo, eh, è rappresentato dai cambiamenti climatici, nel senso eh, delle eh, situazioni estreme, da un lato la siccità, dall'altra eh, le improvvise calamità, le alluvioni. Insomma, tutto elementi eh, che possono concorrere a imprimere un'incertezza sui raccolti e una conseguente volatilità dei prezzi. Del resto questa è forse l'unica certezza che abbiamo che in un sistema di borse anche quelle merci sempre più finanziarizzate interconnesse qualunque accadimento, qualunque evento eh, che accade eh, in, nel mondo comunque non è privo di conseguenze anche a livello commerciale e allora iniziamo questo nostro percorso eh, lascio subito la parola a Darren Cooper per la prima eh, presentazione ok uh, good morning to everybody um, hopefully you can hear me without any problems and Uh, it's, it's always a wonderful time of the year for me to be in Rome. Unfortunately, this year I'm not, but I'm there in the spirit. And hopefully we'll have a good meeting today and um, come up with some ideas about where we're going in the next season. So I'll try and be as concise as possible. But if I speak too quickly for the interpretation, please tell me and I'll, I'll change. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen to open up the presentation. So if everyone can see that, I'll begin. Okay, so the title of the presentation is Global Grains and Oil Seeds Markets Against the Backdrop of COVID-19. Um, because that's the thing that is, you know, in the back, in the forefront of our mind all the time at the moment, in trying to get a gauge on how this will impact markets, how it has impacted markets, and how it will do over the next year or so. So, okay, so what I want to show first and is really how financial markets have dealt with this situation because, as is often the case, uh, the warning signs in any crisis come first from the financial markets because of liquidity, because of the speed in which they can react. So if we look at the US S&P 500, which is obviously the benchmark uh, for, for, stock mark, for the US stock market in New York, we saw that uh, the index climbed quite nicely through to early February. And then we've seen, um, we've seen it fall you know, off a cliff, it has plunged by 34% in the space of a month through to, to mid-March. Now, obviously, that was um, all sentiment driven because the market was realizing just how big this crisis was. It wasn't going to be uh, confined to China and Asia. It was spreading around the world. Um, the good sign is that uh, we've seen some recovery Um, in the period since April. So are the markets, are the financial markets again giving us an early indication of a recovery? Or, or is this just, you know, investors um, buying uh, stocks at uh, qu quite low values? But um, it's quite, it, 
It's quite uh, important at the moment because a number of countries, including in the European Union, uh, are moving to uh, relax restrictions. So I think this is good for sentiment, but certainly it's been quite a difficult uh, first five months of the year. And so, as is often the case, uh, when there's a crisis and uh, investors and other market participants start to panic, there is usually a shift into US dollar denominated assets uh, as safe havens. And we can see that here. Uh, the US dollar index showed quite a, a shift upward around March. But if we look at um, we look at the commodity exporter currencies in the right hand uh, side of this graphic, then we can see that uh, Brazil, Argentina, and I've included Russia as well, there was a massive depreciation in those currencies as uh, investors and other uh, market actors started to panic. The euro has been fairly stable, which is what we would expect as one of the world's major currencies, but um, pretty much everywhere else, the dollar has made very, very strong gains. Although, again, some, some kind of, so if you can see these, these currencies here, that you know, there is a, an early sign that people are less uh, risk averse, that perhaps the situation is um, improving. It, we don't know what an improvement means at this, at this stage, but certainly the dollar has lost some value. So, but if you look at this in terms of a sentiment point of view, that can only be good because it means maybe we've turned the corner. And so what we're, whoops, okay. So what we're most concerned with is what's happened in markets that we're interested in, which are those for grains and oil seeds. So again, I'm showing you another index. This is the one that's produced daily at the International Grains Council in London. And it's been quite volatile over the past year with a number of influences. But again, you can see early part of the year through to mid-March, um, markets started to panic uh, against the backdrop of COVID-19. It's um, been quite volatile since. What we must also remember is uh, some of the movement in this price around here uh, we often see prices under pressure in the early part of the year when uh, crops are coming on stream in South America, for example, um, and also because the planting season in the Northern Hemisphere, the winter planting season, uh, is, is well underway with crops on the horizon. So when the situation is good as it is now, prospects for big crops seem to be on the horizon this would also be a factor that's playing into this. It's not just about the coronavirus pandemic, but certainly it's had an impact in the markets. But in terms of the markets, we've seen some contrasting trends. So if we look at what's happening in wheat, maize and soybean markets in the early part of the year, you can see that under pressure from uncertainty about demand, but also prospects for, for, for large crops in the Northern Hemisphere, and in the case of soybeans and maize, also in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, markets were under pressure. But look at what's happened to rice. Just when the crisis, uh, the coronavirus pandemic took grip around the world, we see prices shoot up. And the way we see this at the International Grains Council is this is partly due to panic buying uh, in a number of countries around the world. Uh, there was panic about food supplies. Rice is a staple across much of the developing world. But also, so uh, none of us are going to restaurants at the moment. So many uh, are looking for a food which can be obtained fairly easily, cooked easily. It's a, you know, a very easy food to put together. And we've seen this shoot up in prices here. We saw some of this in wheat as well, but rice has, is really by itself. And I've used the same scale on both of these charts to really show that. So these are really interesting trends. Uh, and it would appear that food grains have been supported much more so than feed grains because of consumer panic uh, and stockpiling in some countries. So 
What I want to do now is to touch on trade logistics because uh, one of the things that um, the market was panicking about, panicking about initially was how the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown measures and quarantine restrictions that were put in place by many countries, how this was going to affect trade flows and logistics. So I've used soybeans as an example, because at this stage of the year, we'd be seeing huge volumes coming out of South America, uh, particularly to China, but also to Europe uh, and to other markets. And we can see, and this is quite uh, impressive, that trade flows for soybeans, and we could use another commodity, if we wish, they've been progressing at a record pace. You can see here, 109 million tons were exported between October and May. Um, this is the largest volume ever. And this is coming in a year in which we have the coronavirus pandemic. So the message might be uh, that um, there has been very little impact from the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the major exporter countries have made sure that um, they've been able to get supplies to end destinations. This is very encouraging, of course. Um, you know, in addition to, to big crops, we're not seeing um, uh, trade flows being restricted significantly. And in this case, they're progressing at a record pace. And I think this is very important. Um, as regards soybeans, uh, and Valentina mentioned the US-China trade war, um, and that's been in the forefront of our mind for about the past two years. One of the things that is driving the soybean trade at the moment is China's uh, appetite for that commodity. Now, given that uh, coronavirus was uh, impacting China first, this is where it originated from. As that country is further along the cycle in terms of a return to, nor uh, to a normal situation, if whatever a normal situation is. This has coincided with huge volumes from South America. And again, this chart is very important in giving us an indication of how coronavirus is impacting trade flows. And you can see here, if we look at the 1920 season in blue, again, we've seen record volumes out of Brazil. Um, and this is you know, very, very encouraging for the trade, I think. So what, um, if we can stick with the, the subject of trade and logistics, then we had a journalist contact us recently, uh, and this is very important that people uh, try and understand what's really happening in the market. And she said to us, well, there's very little grain getting out of Argentina at the moment. Obviously, that's to do with COVID-19. And we said to her, obviously, that's nothing to do with COVID-19, but that has everything to do with the fact that the River Piranha, which is a major transportation route out of South America, is basically water levels are at historic lows. And I think this picture shows just what's happening there. But this is very important in the context of market interpretation in not linking everything that we're seeing at the moment to coronavirus. It's just not the case. There are other competing factors as well. Um, so if we can just move on. And one of the other questions that uh, has been at, in the minds uh, of all of us, uh, commentators, journalists, uh, you know, business planners is, well, how is coronavirus pandemic, how is this impacting field work and planting? for the crops for the 2021 season. Now I'm using the US here, but I could also use the European Union where we're, we're seeing some wonderful weather in recent weeks, which is partly compensated for the lockdown, is that uh, plantings are progressing pretty smoothly. Uh, inputs, farm inputs are getting to where they need to be. Um, the weather has been very favorable. favorable. Um, very important and we're seeing plantings progressing at uh, a very healthy pace in the United States uh, and as I say we can we can see pretty much a similar situation at other origins so we've dealt with markets 
we've dealt with trade and logistics. We, trade seems to be progressing pretty well, as are plantings in, in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. So the message is not, not negative, it's uh, fairly positive at the moment. And so just to, I'm gonna run through the major crops that we cover in London and uh, just give you some ideas about the situation in 2021 because against the backdrop of COVID-19 we this is what we're all interested in at the moment. In terms of soybeans briefly we're expecting uh, an extremely good crop in um, 2021 as US production rebounds quite considerably. Last year in the United States and this also applied to maize, corn. We, um, we saw very, very difficult weather conditions which led to a marked fall in production where we're expecting a recovery. And we go back to the previous slide, then we can see here that plantings are progressing particularly well. On the demand side, and this is really, I guess, the most interesting, the most important uh, point uh, for all crops at the moment, is that we're expecting consumption to, to increase and actually the pace should quicken in 2021. We've made a number of downward revisions in recent months to the outlook for 1920 because we've seen a reduction in processing and consumption in some of the key consuming areas but in 2021 we'd expect um, consumption to gain pace. Uh, we would expect that economic conditions should improve from where they are now, uh, given that economies are starting to open up again, uh, including in places where we live. Uh, and against the backdrop of rising consumption of meat, uh, we would expect um, demand for feed ingredients to, to improve and soybeans being a particularly important one. But because the crop was um, disappointing last year and because carryovers into the 2021 season are going to be tight, we don't see the potential for a recovery in global stocks. But what we do see is a recovery in trade. Um, China is buying perhaps 60% of the world's imports every year. And um, we would see another, uh, I wouldn't say a solid gain, but another good increase next year um, as the country continues to rebuild its uh, domestic hog sector. Um, and also touching on the issue that Valentina raised about the US-China trade war, what we are building into our forecasts uh, for the next season, uh, and this also applies to United States Department of Agriculture and other forecasters, is that the United States would apply, will account for a bigger uh, share of uh, trade in China next year. We're expecting uh, China to buy uh, more significant quantities in the early part of the 2021 season from the United States as South American supplies remain really tight. So if we move on to, to corn, again, we're expecting uh, a record global crop in 2021. Um, consumption is set to return to growth on feed and industrial use. One of the things that has been um, pretty clear from coronavirus in the early part of this year that is that it has had, from the corn perspective, a pretty dramatic impact on industrial use for ethanol in the United States. So that has been weak uh, because quite simply, there are fewer people using road networks uh, for one thing. Um, and next year, when the situation improves from an economic perspective, we'd expect industrial demand to, to strengthen, but also because of this record crop, which is feeding into marketing channels, we would expect that uh, corn would see some gains in the feed sector as well, because this, these record supplies have to go somewhere. Um, in terms of stocks, a small, uh, a small uh, downturn there, but we have to be careful when we interpret stock figures. Uh, it's the thing that I always emphasize when I come to Roma Ciriali is that so many of these are believed to be located in China and we just don't know how big or how small they are because these figures are not published. So it's really 
a nominal figure, a nominal meaning. You can't take it too seriously. What you can take seriously is all of the stocks at the bottom of this visual, which um, largely reflect major exporters' inventories. That tells us, that gives us more of an indication about how comfortable the world market is and where prices might head. And uh, just a final word on corn in terms of world trade. Yes, probably we're looking at a record high in 2021, a 4% increase. As I've said, we expect corn to, to sort of move into those feed marketing channels in Asia and in other regions next year as economic conditions improve and meat production rises. So finally, in terms of wheat, I'm not, um, I'm not a particular wheat expert, uh, so I'll, I, obviously I'll leave this to Rutger and Svetlana uh, in particular to tell us what's happening uh, in their respective regions. Um, but um, just a, a few headline figures for, from this visual. We would expect output to head up to a new record in 2021. Um, on the demand side, um, as I mentioned earlier, there has been an impact in terms of, of, of food consumption, um, particularly in the case of rice. The wheat, we would expect a modest increase in 2021 in terms of food demand. Um, but in terms of feed, again, if we switch back to the previous visual and we see this heavy corn crop that's coming on stream over the next year or so based on our projections. This is likely to, to make inroads into the feed dimension of wheat consumption. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's where we see that. In terms of closing stocks, again, I could just repeat what I've said in the context of corn. Uh, any increase in global stocks is likely to be due to China, but also India where big crops are being produced season on season. And so we have to be very careful in, in, in interpreting these stock figures. But in terms of the major exporters, we probably see a small increase next year, not very big, very, very modest. And trade, again, because of inroads from corn into, into the feed dimension of consumption, we'd expect trade to be fairly steady year on year. But a very good volume of 178 million tons. Okay, so this presentation of mine is slightly shorter than usual because of the challenges we have in terms of the, the, new, uh, the new platform that we're using. So I'll just come to some conclusions now. Um, some points to note. So we've seen that markets have been impacted by COVID-19 in different ways. So rice, uh, we saw the market spike higher on panic buying, a uh, big part of what led the market higher. But also external markets more generally have been influential. We saw the sell-off in equities in stock markets around the world, but, and also crude oil, uh, which obviously was impacted by fewer people being on the roads, uh, for one thing. Um, and in terms of just general slowdown in business activity. In terms of trade and logistics, that has been a particularly bright spot. Uh, I've used the example of the soybean trade to demonstrate that. But if we were to look at wheat, we look at corn, all the commodities that matter to us, generally, generally, there hasn't been a particular problem. Okay. Uh, in terms of field work for 2021, crops, are also well advanced in the Northern Hemisphere. And this has been supported by mostly beneficial weather. However, the full impact of uh, the coronavirus pandemic is still subject to considerable conjecture, especially in the context of the broader economic conditions and how this will impact demand moving forward. But we're taking a fairly positive view on things as the economy, we expect that to, to recover in the next year or so. And so I just want to uh, just say a few words about our conference in London. Uh, typically, it's in London on the 10th of June. Uh, this year, we're ha having it uh, on a virtual platform like we are today. Um, and it's going to comprise 60 international speakers 
and we'll be discussing all of the issues that matter, such as globalization, uh, investment, climate change, and the role of exchanges. Um, and we'll be holding specific commodity panels focusing on wheat, corn, soybeans, rice, pulses, and ethanol. Um, usually we would, um, the entrance fee for this would be probably about 800 euros, but we've actually reduced it to one eighth of that. So it doesn't cost anything at all really to get into this uh, conference. So if you want to hear from international speakers from around the world on how they view COVID-19, then please have a look at the website. I've left the link there and uh, we'd love to see you online on the 10th of June. And so my final slide is really one of hope really in that we, I would anticipate that we'll all be in this place next year, which is our natural place. Um, it's been wonderful to speak to you online today, but it's so much nicer to be inside uh, the temple there and hopefully we'll be there one year today. Thank you to everyone for listening. Grazie, grazie Darren, hai parlato alle menti, hai parlato al cuore, eh, con quest'ultima immagine eh, che ci, veramente eh, ci riporta al ricordo della passata edizione, ma che sicuramente è di ottimo auspicio per la prossima eh, edizione eh, di Roma Cereali. Quindi comunque un, tu, un intervento improntato all'ottimismo, quindi eh, direi che ne abbiamo bisogno. Vediamo se eh, Rutger nella sua analisi del continente americano e anche dei paesi eh, del Nord Africa eh, ci conferma eh, questo stesso eh, approccio. Rutger. Thank you Valentina. Oh, one second. I'm sharing the wrong screen. Here we go. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Valentina, for giving you a sweet the opportunity again to speak at uh, Roma Ceriali. Now, of course, uh, next year we hope to meet uh, all of you uh, again in person, but uh, we're glad to be given uh, this opportunity. The title of my presentation is The Durham Outlook for North America and uh, North Africa. And I will start this presentation with a disclaimer. So the forward-looking estimates in this presentation were developed using trade contacts and official sources, but they are not official estimates of the US Department of Agriculture. The USDA will release their first official US Durham production estimates on July 10 of this year, in their crop uh, production report. Now the outline of my presentation is as follows. In the first part of my presentation, I'll discuss the 2020 Durham production outlook for North America, and that includes the US, Canada, and Mexico. And then in the second part of my presentation, I'll discuss the Durham production outlook for North Africa in a brief way. And then I will end my presentation by drawing some conclusions. As most of you know, there are two different uh, production regions for durum wheat in the US. There is the so-called Northern Durham production region in North Dakota and Montana, where durum wheat is uh, planted at the end of April uh, and in May and is harvested uh, at the end of August uh, and in September. And then there is the second production region, the so-called desert durum production region. Um, and that uh, wheat is grown in Arizona and California. It is all grown under irrigation. It is planted in November and December, and it is harvested uh, from the middle of May until the end of June. Now, based on USDA's prospective plantings report that was published on March 31st this year, the total US Durham area this year is projected down 
by 4% to 522,000 hectares. Now, if realized, that would be the lowest Durham area since 1959 in the US. And it would be 32% below the 10 year average. The Northern Durham area in North Dakota and Montana is projected down 5% from last year. However, trade contacts I've been talking to are expecting that the final planted area, uh, Northern Durham area, will be 14% higher than last year due to favorable pricing of Durham wheat versus spring wheat. The Desert Durham area in Arizona and California is projected up 17% from last year, but it is down 67% compared to the year 2015. So a very low area of Desert Durum in Arizona and California. Now this chart shows the trend in the total US Durum area that has been planted. About 20 years ago, 1.2 million hectares of uh, durum wheat were planted in the US, and that has trended down to about 600,000 uh, hectares uh, these days in 2020. Now, as I've told you, the total uh, durum area is projected at 522,000 hectares by the USDA. Uh, if realized, that would be down 4% from last year. However, trade contacts that I've been in touch with, they are estimating that the total U.S. Durham area this year will be about 590,000 hectares. And if realized, that would be 9% higher than last year. Now, the reasons why the Durham area increase in the US will be modest uh, are first of all that farmers are still very frustrated about the quality problems and the corresponding price discounts on their crop of last year, the 2019 crop. Second reason is that the new crop bids for August are not attractive enough for US Durham farmers. Durham prices have remained fairly stable in the past six months. Uh, and at the same time, cash prices for most other competitive crops have declined, which of course is slightly positive for Durham wheat. And for that reason, uh, it is expected that some growers will switch from spring wheat and barley into Durham wheat. Now this chart shows uh, the cash prices uh, that elevators in North Dakota are paying to farmers uh, for top quality uh, milling uh, durum wheat and for 14% uh, protein hardwood spring wheat. Now the uh, black line represents the cash durum price that is paid to farmers and the red line represents the cash hard red spring wheat price that is paid to farmers. Now, as you can see, the price of uh, durum wheat has been higher than the price of uh, spring wheat since July of 2019. And since then, the price premium of uh, durum wheat over spring wheat has widened uh, to about $50 per metric ton. Now, at this moment, uh, farmers are getting paid $220 per metric ton. Um, and that is for top quality milling uh, durum wheat. And uh, this price has been fairly stable during the past uh, seven months, whereas the prices of competitive crops such as spring wheats have declined in recent months. Uh, so for that reason, it is expected that um, yeah, some farmers will switch from spring wheat and barley into durum wheat this year. Some information about planting progress in the US. Uh, for northern durum wheat, the planting started later due to the cool and wet conditions in the early spring. 
since the middle of May, we have seen significant planting progress. Uh, finally, the weather conditions got better in uh, the northern plains. Now, at this moment, much of the northern Durham region could use some rain. So what we have seen is that top soil, soil moisture levels have been dropping. And there is a growing area of moderate drought in the southwest of North Dakota. For Desiderum, the harvest has, has started in the middle of May and it will continue until the end of June. Now this chart is showing the, the durum wheat planting progress in uh, North Dakota. As of May 24, 70% of the durum crop in North Dakota uh, was planted, compared to 68% uh, last year. And that is 10% 10 behind the five-year average of 80%. So the planting pace is comparable to last year, but it is behind the five-year average. Emergence, as of May 24, was 30% of the North Dakota durum wheat crop, and that is 13% behind the five-year average. Some information about the production volume of U.S. durum wheat. Uh, the initial and unofficial estimate for U.S. durum wheat production is 1.6 million metric ton in 2020, compared to 1.46 million metric ton last year. So if realized, that would be an increase of 9% compared to last year. Now that includes 200,000 metric ton of durum wheat, of sorry, of desert durum wheat, an increase of 29% compared to last year, and uh, a northern durum wheat production of 1.4 million metric ton, and that would be an increase of 7% compar compared to last year, if realized. Now, the production estimate for northern durum wheat assumes a trend yield of 2.5 metric ton per hectare, and that is slightly above the five year average. Now, please consider that the crop is just in the ground, it has just been planted, so we recommend you to pay close attention to the conditions during the growing season. Timely rains are needed for adequate crop development. This chart shows that uh, this year's US durum wheat production is estimated at 1.6 million metric ton, that is an unofficial estimate, and if realized, it would be up 10% from last year, but it is still 20% below the five-year average. Now, taking a closer look at the U.S. durum supply and demand situation, I would like to highlight um, the stock-to-use ratio at the end of the current marketing year, 1920, and the stocks to use ratio at the end of the next marketing year, 2021. Now, as you can see, the stock to use ratio at the end of the current marketing year, 1920, is just 20%, and that is down 30% from last year, so very, very low. And that is because of a lower production in 2019, and also because of much higher exports in marketing year 1920, especially to Italy. The uh, stocks to use ratio at the end of the next marketing year 2021 continues to be at a very low level and is projected at 22%, despite lower exports uh, of US duro wheat uh, in the next marketing year, also to Italy. After the record high exports uh, this marketing year, we are projecting lower exports to Italy this marketing year. Moving on to Canada and the production outlook there. Statistics Canada is projecting the total Canadian Durham area in 2020 at 2.12 million hectares. Now that is up 7% uh, from last year if realized, but it would still be um, about 8% below the five-year average of 2.28 million metric ton. However, trade contacts that I've been in touch with 
are estimating the planted area of uh, durum wheat in Canada in 2020 at 2.33 million hectares. And if realized, that would be up 17% from last year. Now, trade contacts are estimating the durum area higher than the estimates of Statistics Canada because of the durum price premium versus spring wheat that has increased since early April. And for that reason, it is expected that more farmers will plan Durham as a last minute decision. Planting progress in Canada. We have seen cold planting conditions, just like in the US. The planting was later than usual. And by May 18, 71% of the Durham crop in Saskatchewan was planted. And that is almost equal to the five year average. The soil moisture condition in Western Canada is better than a year ago, and the topsoil moisture conditions are mostly adequate. However, again, uh, many things can happen between now and uh, the harvest time. The growing season is still very long, crop is just in the ground, and timely rainfall during the growing season will be essential. Canadian durum wheat production uh, is projected at uh, 5.9 million metric ton in marketing year 2021. If realized, that would be an increase of 18% compared to last year. Now, this production of 5.9 million metric ton assumes an average yield of uh, 2.6 metric ton per hectare and that is equal to the 10-year average. Now this mid-production scenario of 5.9 million metric ton um, is 400,000 metric ton higher in terms of production volume than the uh, statistics or than the uh, estimate of Statistics Canada. Statistics Canada is only estimating the um, Canadian durum crop this year at 5.5 million metric ton. The number I would like to highlight in this slide is the uh, very low projected stocks to use ratio at the end of the next marketing year 2021. It is just projected at 17% and that is only slightly higher then the ending stocks, uh, the stocks to use ratio at the end of the current marketing year, that is 15%. So ending stocks are very tight in Canada at this moment and are projected to remain very tight also into the next marketing year. This slide shows that Canadian durum wheat production is projected uh, at 5.9 million metric ton in 2020, and if realized, that would be up 12% from last year. Moving on to Mexico. Uh, Mexico has started to harvest its student wheat crop at the end of April, and um, by April 30, 15% of all of Mexico's wheat harvest was complete. Production outlook for durum wheat in Mexico is estimated at 1.6 million metric ton this year. And if realized, that would be 8% lower than the last year. And only less than 0.8 million metric ton of that will be available for exports this year. Continuing with the second part of my presentation, and I will be brief here, uh, North Africa. Um, this information has been collected uh, by my colleagues uh, in the Casablanca office of US Wheat Associates, and they have been in touch with the three government agencies in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia to get these estimates. The production outlook for durum wheat in Morocco is projected at 0.75 million metric ton this year. If realized, that would be down 44% from last year, and it is 55% below the 10 year average. Reasons for that are the persistent drought conditions, 
that we have seen throughout the growing season in Morocco, and that will result in very low yields. In Algeria, the situation is much more positive, and the production outlook in Algeria this year is uh, 3.5 million metric ton. Uh, if realized, that would be up 11% from last year and 44% above the 10 year average. Especially the outlook in northeastern Algeria is very positive, and that is where most of the Algerian durum wheat crop is grown. Tunisia, finally, production outlook in Tunisia is projected at 0.97 million metric ton, down 23% from last year and if realized, that would be 2% below the 10-year average. It is noteworthy that the planted area in Tunisia was down 19% this year, and the reason for that was the drought at planting time. Total North African production this year is projected at 5.2 million metric ton, and that would be down 10% from last year, but it would still be 2% above the 10 year average. I'll skip this slide and I'll proceed with this one. This slide is showing the evolution of the combined stocks to use, to use ratio of the three major durum wheat producers and exporters, being the US, Canada, and the EU. Now the combined stocks to, re, to use ratio of these three major durum wheat producers is projected to drop sharply from 26% at the end of marketing year 1819 to just 13% at the end of the current marketing year 1920. And the combined stocks to use ratio for next marketing year, for the end of next marketing year, is projected at just 14%. So it means that uh, uh, the, the ending stocks in these three major producing countries are very tight and will continue to be very tight into the next marketing year. Finally, I will end my presentation by drawing some conclusions. The Durham pricing will remain firm until we know better on, on the Canadian and US crop size and quality. We are seeing at this moment very tight 1920 ending stocks of Canadian and US durum wheat. Now that is the result of the relatively low production in both countries in 2019, and also because of the good exports that both countries have seen in marketing year 1920. Also, the ending stocks of Canadian and US durum wheat in the next marketing year, 2021, are projected to be very tight. And that means that a good quality crop from North America is needed this year. Any significant production issues in the US or Canada could get the market nervous again and could quickly push prices higher again. Now on this, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I believe there will be an opportunity for asking questions uh, at the end of the last presentation. Thank you again. Grazie, grazie a te Ruth. Sì, come di consueto vi chiederei, lasciamo al termine eh, tutte le domande, siamo leggermente eh, in ritardo rispetto alla tabella di marcia, ma del resto eh, ci stiamo adattando ai tempi della diretta web. Noi siamo abituati eh, diciamo all'incontro eh, fisico di persona dove c'è modo anche di soffermarsi eh, maggiormente. Qui siamo un po' eh, diciamo 
schiavizzati da questi tempi eh, dati dalla, dalla virtualità dell'incontro. Consentitemi, eh, ringrazio Rutger eh, per la sua eh, esaustiva illustrazione, consentitemi di ringraziare, lo faccio adesso prima della chiusura dell'evento, le due bravissime interpreti che ci stanno aiutando con la traduzione simultanea che potete tutti seguire impostando il canale audio per convenzione sulla bandiera eh, dello spagnolo ringrazio Luisa eh, Malentacchi e Ilaria Bonavita e eh, chiudo questo eh, momento questo piccolo inserimento tecnico per introdurre eh, diciamo la nostra prossima relatrice eh, Svetlana eh, Sinkowska ja, e, e chiederei a Svetlana eh, diciamo i mercati sembravano risentire, siamo andati un po' in fibrillazione quando la federazione russa lo scorso aprile ha annunciato eh, il blocco dell'export del grano, dell'orzo, quantomeno fino eh, al primo luglio. Allora ci puoi dare qualche elemento in più? È vero che anche in passato la federazione russa ci aveva abituato a queste chiusure periodiche, però eh, se ci puoi dare qualche elemento di orizzonte nell'immediato. Grazie Sveta. Uh, thank you so much Valentina, buongiorno. Unfortunately not in Rome personally this time, but having seen all of you, I can feel I'm in Rome and thank you once again for this opportunity. Yes, Russia is always full of surprises and this year is not exclusion because as you uh, know that this April, on April 1st, it was not a joke, then Russia has implemented quotation. It limited the amount of wheat traders could export till the end of the season uh, by 7 million tons. And it was quite unexpected and it, it, it was very, you know, that when Ministry of Agriculture make the calculator for this quota, there was even technical problems with that calculator because there was very intense efforts of traders to use it. So now uh, the situation is more clear and for current week we have only 190,000 uh, tons left on use from that quota. Also uh, for current moment I know that about half a million of quota was concealed of traders who preliminary uh, took these quotas and it was distributed to another trader. And uh, currently the Minister for Agriculture said that starting from the 1st of June they go going to uh, stop using uh, this quotine for experts but who knows which surprises will be with a new crop coming. No one knows. So um, I will continue my presentation and we'll be back to Russia a little bit, but let me first start from my native country, from Ukraine. And this season, uh, Ukraine uh, has quite interesting situation for our planting campaign. And it's not only because of the COVID, like everyone is challenging this, you know, black swan, but also whether this year is unpredictable. For example, we have not only unstable weather conditions when we have droughts, quite intense droughts and very cold May and very warm March, but also we have had such rare climatic anomalies in Ukraine like, for example, sandstorms or tornadoes, which have never been in that part of the world. Also, uh, COVID made a little bit stressful planting, uh, a little bit stressful understanding. Will farmers will have enough of uh, uh, input? But in result, situation was more or less okay. So let me proceed and show you in pictures. First of all, let us see what happened with wintering, because in Ukraine, most part of wheat planted is winter wheat. And this uh, not typical weather, not typical winter, very warm winter with minimum of snow. 
have resulted that in some regions, a situation with winter wheat was quite difficult. And even, uh, yes, high probability of crops recovering, but April was very dry. So some regions like Southern regions have had to replant wheat. But for some farmers, it's not feasible to replant. So they left these fields just as they are like for resting. It's not massive, but it's still quite a big deal this year with, you know, this not very good situation with wintering, wintering of uh, wheat. For barley, you can see also situation is uh, somewhere not very brilliant. Talking about dynamics of spring grains planting, in spite of fears that it's not COVID was, you know, slow down the process. It was weather, it was drought, it was dry soil. But uh, in spite that Ukraine has a quite strong lockdown starting, I think, from middle of March, lockdown was more, you know, strong in big cities, but villages and rural areas they more or less continued to live in their more or less normal life. So I can say that this planting weather has impacted much more than COVID situation in Ukraine. Just very few for you to understand that this pink and red areas, this is dry areas. This is lack of precipitation. And you see this like huge part of Ukrainian territory. This is what we have had in March, in April, and only in May, like second part of May, we have received rains in most part of Ukraine. One more factor uh, which impacted Ukrainian farmers and traders this spring, and it was very uninspected, is a currency factor. Normally, last five, six years, Ukrainian currency is going down, depreciation against United States dollar. But this spring, we have different trend and Ukrainian currency became stronger. And of course, it's not a good news for exporters. And farmers also were not ready because most companies put in their calculations uh, forecasting budget you know, downtrend for greenness. So this is new reality farmers have to understand in order to be competitive uh, for export prices. You can see here that during planting, except for, you know, uh, lockdown and um, weather prices, export prices also were not very good. This is exact the time when the farmers started to plant most part of crops most prices for commodities went down and it's also you know factor we should understand and watch in order to understand mood and intentions of farmers so for our forecast please have a look our agency currently forecasting decrease in wheat production decrease in barley production and this is mostly for winter parts of crops but we quite uh, okay for corn and for other grains and we'll see because now it's very difficult to understand in the end of may how all these uh, two weeks of rains were beneficial for crops and one more worry i would like to highlight now is not even quantity but the quality of the new crop because already we hear that some traders share information that ukraine probably will have decrease in quality especially for wheat so this is the question we should watch very attentively and just for you to see the 10 year you know trend so you can see that yes this spring ukraine has decreased planting areas but it's not very critical decrease it's like like more or less typical ups and downs nothing very you know special Talking about Russia, which is full of surprises, and you can see one of the big surprises that, unlike Ukraine, on Russian market was two completely different trends on export FOB prices and on CPT domestic market. 
So you see that Russian market here showed us less dependence upon you know, global prices. Also, Russian currency this year, you know, it was decreasing, it was a little bit up, and then it started to go down again. And still, Russian ruble was very unpredictable, and it also was one of the factors of the risks for many traders. Talking about rains, yes, like Ukraine, this season, uh, many parts of Russia have problems, lack of rains. Uh, you can see on the second map, this big yellow spot, it's areas with a lack of precipitation. And it's quite big areas. And these areas are particularly the places where Russia produces most part, part of its wheat. But for today, situation is getting better because Russia have rains in May quite sufficient. Hope it will help to to increase and the forecast for production and to make it like okay. You can see our current forecast and we are quite uh, optimistic for wheat, but I can tell that other private consulting companies are even more optimistic than us. Our forecast is still moderate. So I have heard even 80, 82. We'll see it's for wheat forecasting. For barley, uh, we expect the crop will decrease. Uh, for other crops, it hopefully to be more or less similar to, to previous season. And once again, just to have a look on this average, we can see that the trend is more or less like 10 year average, nothing very special. Russia is still big exporter of wheat and it will continue to export big amounts of wheat. Very interesting situation uh, were in Kazakhstan because when I was last two years uh, made my presentation in Roma Ceriali in Rome, I always highlighted that Kazakhstan having the trend every year to decrease the areas under grains, especially wheat, and to increase production of oil seeds. What we see this year, first of all, before Russia has implemented this quotation on April 1st, it was a Kazakhstan who was very rapidly reacted on lockdown and together with lockdown, they implemented export ban for wheat flour and for sunflower oil. And of course, neighboring countries like Ukraine and Russia uh, watching Kazakhstan and felt a little bit nervous. So Kazakhstan really decreased in wheat production. But let's have a look on this year because this year it trend is developing, but not that much because COVID uh, and all this lockdown situation made all the countries once again think about not only export, but about, you know, security, food security of the country, which is the key now. So you can see the trend for planting areas in Kazakhstan for wheat and for barley. And uh, after the Kazakhstan has banned the export of wheat flour and sunflower oil, in the middle of April, Kazakhstan has implemented export quotas for export of wheat. Ex export quota size was uh, 200,000 per month. So in April, these 200,000 were taken by 21 companies, 21 exporters. And in May, this amount of 200,000 were taken by 79 exporting countries. Currently, uh, Kazakhstan is going to uh, stop this practice and officials said that in June, they're not going to make this quotation for um, exports of wheat. You can see here our forecasts are more or less optimistic and we think that uh, weather condition in Kazakhstan is quite good. 
currently the planting campaign is going on its you know active uh, stage and it will be finished in a week or two in most parts of Kazakhstan areas. So we suppose that Kazakhstan could have quite good crop this year. To conclude, let me just show you on this slide three countries and our primary estimation of export potential of Ukraine, of Russia and Kazakhstan. So you see that comparing to 2019-20, the situation looks quite okay, especially for Kazakhstan, especially for Russia. But we live in an uncertain world. We live in the world full of unexpected, you know, turn of events. So we hope that those countries will be able to realize the potential. But the question is quality for Ukraine. Question is state regulation of export for Russia and for Kazakhstan. So agriculture is never boring. So let's wash our ha hands, have hope and watch what the market is preparing for us. And thank you again, Valentina and your great team for making it possible even in such you know, unpredictable times. Bravo, grazie. Grazie, grazie a te Sveta che veramente ci porti un raggio di sole anche eh, a distanza, è sempre un piacere averti con noi oltre che per la qualità ovviamente delle tue informazioni e delle tue presentazioni. Ehm, a questo punto io passerei la parola eh, rapidamente a Marcial eh, Guer che ci offre eh, un focus sulla situazione eh, francese come dicevo siamo leggermente in ritardo sulla tabella di marcia comunque eh, i nostri ascoltatori credo che non abbiano di che annoiarsi eh, approfitto per informare che successivamente comunque al termine della giornata rilasceremo il consueto rapporto eh, di Roma Cereali che tiene conto dei contenuti che si sono eh, sviluppati e affrontati nel corso di questa giornata e che sarà reso disponibile per tutte le persone registrate. A te Marcial, grazie. Thank you, uh, thank you Valentina. Um, I share my screen. Okay, thank you very much Valentina. Thank you to Roma Cerli for welcoming uh, us again this year. It's always uh, it's always a pleasure. A pleasure. Uh, the conditions are quite different and a bit strange uh, this year. That's, I, I will try to present the French Harvest 2020 as well as possible uh, through this screen. Uh, first of all, I'm going to review French export of soft wheat, durum wheat and barley in order to show the country's place in world trade. I will then present Italy's position in this context. And then I will give an overview of how were the seeding conditions for the winter crops. I will show how many hectares were um, finally sold with soft wheat, durum wheat and barley. Then I will present the crops conditions from the sowing to now. And uh, finally, I will present the production estimation for these crops in France. Maybe it's the most important today. So the purpose of the first point is to place the French origin back in world trade and to review the performance of the 1920 campaign. So in red, uh, you can see the five-year average of export to the region. And in green, in green uh, are represented the, the export for the 1920 campaign. Uh, and the country, the countries uh, detailed in black show the average export over five years. Concerning soft wheat, France exports an average of 7.6 million tonnes to the EU and one, uh, 9 million tonnes to third countries. 
this year, France will have exported as much as the average, that is 7.6 million ton. On the other hand, France will have exported a lot to third countries. Uh, we have 7.4 million ton against 5 million ton on the average for the Maghreb, 2.65 million ton against 1.5 million ton in Africa, uh, 1.25. Allora, c'è un'interruzione sulla linea sul collegamento di Martial, quindi come vedete anche dal fermo immagine si è interrotto l'audio anche per le nostre interpreti. Eh, quindi purtroppo è un problema tecnico che non dipende da noi, ma dal collegamento internet. Eh, adesso proviamo a vedere se Martial è in grado di proseguire o altrimenti eh, passiamo al, al successivo intervento in attesa che venga ripristinato il collegamento. Magari intanto io mi veniva Svetlana, volevo mh, chiedere a te già prima ehm, come questo lockdown, queste restrizioni sì. hanno Anche. avuto ha avuto un impatto sul trasporto su gomma, sull'export dei prodotti, in particolare dal nord-est. Sembra che cambi un po' la geografia, la modalità dei trasporti, eh, anche con un utilizzo eh, delle navi, il che comporta però tempi di percorrenza lunghi e carichi molto maggiori. Quindi volevo da te un commento anche rispetto alla geografia dei trasporti all'interno dell'Unione Europea per, per quanto riguarda l'approvvigionamento di materie prime. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm here. Uh, ah, sorry, sorry gra grazie Marcial. Allora magari Sveta possiamo uh, questa uh, domanda se possiamo poi dare la risposta appena Marcial termina. Grazie. Approfittiamo grazie. che si è ripristinato. Okay. Grazie. Okay. Prego Marcial a te. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, sorry again. So, um i say that um this year um for durum i i was speaking about durum despite um uh, despite uh the low production in uh, in france the france exported almost as much wheat as the average but of course french stocks are therefore very low and uh concerning barley uh, France exports on average as much to the euro than to sales country, which represents about 3.5 million tons. And uh, production this year was high. This explains the increase of export to the EU this year. And uh, with regard to third countries, France has not been very competitive, except in China, we can see uh, 1.4 million tons uh, to Asia against 1.52 million ton uh, on the average, so it was a big year on China. So now we will see how Italy is positioned in French export. Um, concerning soft wheat, France will return about above the five years average this year with about 1 million ton, but we are still far from the 10 years average. Uh, we can see 1 million ton maybe this year against uh, 1.2 million ton for the 10 years average. average. Concerning the room width, despite the low production, Italy was favored. Uh, in fact, we see that export will be surely above the five year average on the 10 years average with 0 0.5 million ton. So it could be a, a great year for the export of the room width uh, on uh, Italy. Uh, France, as you know, uh, is a neighbor of Italy, we can see, and uh, multiple means of transport allow a good reactivity. The traceability that France can offer is also a strong point of our geographical proximity. Now we are going to talk about the future 2021 campaign. 
Uh, I will present the conditions under which the winter crops were sowed. Then I will show how many hectares were finally sowed with soft wheat, drum wheat and barley. September was very dry. It was therefore very difficult to sow in a soil that was too hard. October, as you can see on the picture on the right, was very wet. It was soon very difficult to move around the field, around in the field, and many plots were flooded. So the period when it was possible for farmers to sow was very, very short, and many farmers were never able to sow during the winter. So soft wheat seedings were sever severely disrupted. There were 10, 15, 20 days delays with some loss of crops with excess of water. Last year, like the five-year average, the soft wheat area were about 5 million hectares. This year, the surface should be between 4.5 million hectares and 4.75 million hectares a decrease of 5 to 10% compared to the average and compared to last year. This decrease can be observed over almost the whole country, but is more significant in the south half of France, here, uh, where the precipitations were very important. The room rate acreage is expected to be similar to last year, that means about uh, 0 0.249 million hectares, uh, the lowest in more than 10 years. Um, in the southeast and west ocean area, the area will, be, will decrease by 10% here and here. The small, um, no, it, it, um, it is expected to be unchanged in the southwest and increased by 10% in the center. The small white triangles show the percentage of seeding that took place after January the 1st. Indeed, the very wet conditions from October postponed the sowing dates. Thus, we see that in the center, for example, 30% of the sowing were done after January 1st. This delay will have an impact on yield for the room rate, of course. Only the barley acreage is more important this year. 3% higher than last year and 9% higher than the average. In fact, the, the rap seed that was sown in September did not emerge because it was too dry. As we show in September, it was very dry in France. Farmers Reseeded spring barley instead. This is why the increase is in the northeastern quarter of France. I will then present you the crops condition from the emergence to know. As we have seen, it rained heavily in October and the rain continued until mid March. We observed plus 100 to 200% rainfall over this period. This has impacted the crop establishment. Since the end of March, it has been very, it has been very dry. We observed only five millimeter in 25 days. This has impacted the joint stage. A few rain, at the, end of, at the end of April, limited the impact of the dry weather. But, unfortunately, the, the dry conditions have, uh, have gone on across Europe during the months of May, except, except in, Spain, in Spain. Yields will inevitably be impacted at the second time by this persistent dryness. After the wet period, we had a dry period. For the crops condition, uh, we can see that 83% of soft wheat was at the heading stage on the 22nd of May here, compared to only 
percent last year at the same date. We can estimate it that that um, wheat uh, is 12 days early, so harvest could be very early this day, this year. Sorry. Uh, crops condition are not very good with 57% of good to excellent this year compared to 79% last year. The same graph for uh, grown, for durum wheat, um, we, uh, we have 88% of the crops who are at the heating stage compared to 80 last year. This is six days earlier than last year. 62 of the room rate is in good to excellent condition compared to 70% last year. And finally, concerning barley, heating is complete, whereas 96% was advanced last year at the same date. So seven days ahead of schedule this year for barley. Barley condition is only 52% good to excellent compared to 75% last year. Finally, I will present production estimation for soft wheat, drum wheat and barley. And as you can uh, understand, the, the forecasts are not very, very good. Okay, in, in the table, the two blue columns show two different forecasts, one from Strategy Grand, SG, and one from uh, the European Union Statistic, EU. Uh, the green column shows last year's data. According to the forecasts, the French common wheat production will be between 33 million ton and 34 million ton. On the graph, we see the two estimations represented by the green draw bars. The, estimate, the estimated production is therefore rather low on the historical level. Durham wheat production is estimated according to Arvalis at 1.3 million ton and 1.33 million ton according to the European Union. The lowest surface area for more than 10 years coupled with the yield impacted by humidity at the beginning and dryness at the end leads to the lowest production since 1997. The exportable available for its first customer, Italy, will of course be impacted, but it will be privileged so as this year, so as this year compared to the other countries. And finally, barley production will be between 12.3 and 13 million ton, according to Strategy Grand on the European Union statistic. The impact on yield is offset by the increase of acreage, notably by an increase of spring barley sowing. So uh, I want to finish my presentation uh, with uh, a small conclusion. Uh, uh, conditions were, were very difficult for winter cereals with a very wet start that did not allow a good sowing on a very dry second half of the season. In addition to have an impact on, il on yields, the dry weather favored a very early harvest. There is a structure, structural decrease in the room wheat area. This crop must not be sweetened with extinction. This year's low yield with further, will further highlight the decline of the availability of the room, room, of the room wheat in France. The main reason for this is that producers believe that the agronomic risk is too high compared to the two low price different with soft wheat. But we have still durum wheat in France, where we have still durum wheat in France and a lot of farmers still trust in this crop. So there is really hope. 
thank you, grazie mille per la vostra attenzione. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very good 2021 campaign, a very beautiful campaign. Thank you again, Valentina. Thank you, Luisa and Ilaria for the translation. You, you are my voice. And uh, I want to say France Export Serial will be really happy to meet you in, uh, in real at our annual uh, rendezvous uh, that is set on Friday, October 2nd uh, at the Palazzo delle Esposizioni. So we will be very happy to, to meet you at this occasion. And thank you very much, everybody. Grazie, grazie a te Marzial, hai fatto tu, ci hai pensato tu a fare il lancio del prossimo appuntamento e quindi eh, con te ci rivedremo e con spero tanti delle persone che ci stanno seguendo ci rivedremo di persona già nel mese di ottobre senza attendere eh, la prossima edizione Roma Cereali. Se eh, Mauro Bruni ha un secondo di pazienza lascerei ancora la parola a Sveta che, a, a la, eh, che ci era debitata di una risposta durante, che avevo fatto durante l'interruzione di Marzial. Grazie Sveta. Volentieri, volentieri. Grazie. Uh, as Darren mentioned that logistics during lockdown time was a big, you know, question of worry and trouble, but very big surprise that here in, in Ukraine and Russia, uh, the more problems uh, had um, small crops uh, related to container shipments because after China stopped its activity in February, March with the lockdown, most part of container business is connected to this flows of goods from and to China. So for containers, yes, it was quite, you know, difficult time. But talking about wheat, corn and all these commodities which being transported by big vessels, we even in, I think, April have made a video from Novorossiysk port where uh, one of the uh, transport company made a video near big ship going to Italy with the Russian grains. So, yes, some process a little bit slow down, but I can say that we have big logistic problems here in the ports of you know, uh, export in, in Black Sea region. But it really was a big problem then in March in India. Before lockdown, they have big strike of, of port workers. So it hit more sunflower oil export because it's like main commodity Ukraine and even now Russia shipped to, abroad to India. Talking about wheat, uh, main buyers of wheat from Ukraine and Russia is Egypt, Turkey, uh, Indonesia, and some European countries. So we haven't seen like rapid decrease. More decrease were related to these uninspected regulations. And be because in ports, uh, there are normally not big concentration on people and many processes are being made automatically. So, you know, for ports, they still use all these, you know, protection things much early before they have HASP system, they have ISO system. So these production, you know, areas are already ready in many aspects because of all these certificates they have to such, you know, extra measures of protection of people. That's it. Grazie. Thank you. Grazie, grazie a te Sveta e allora senza altro indugio passerei la parola a Mauro Bruni, presidente eh, di Arete, l'ultimo degli interventi programmati per questa eh, mattinata tecnica. Grazie Mauro. Grazie a te Valentina, buongiorno a tutti. Ecco, dovrebbe arrivare la presentazione. Buongiorno a tutti, è un piacere essere qua e di questo ringrazio, vi ringrazio e ringrazio Valentina in particolare. Siamo in ritardo, per cui vado subito al dunque. Eh, la mia presentazione sarà articolata fondamentalmente in quattro capitoli. Eh, la produzione del grano in Italia, soprattutto. Eh, due parole rapide sul Lazio. Eh, la produzione negli altri paesi del mondo e di prezzi eh, prevedibili e, e due parole di conclusione. 
Ovviamente parlerò solo di grano duro, i miei colleghi eh, che mi hanno anticipato e hanno brillantemente parlato dei, del mondo dei cereali, talvolta anche di soia, io mi concentrerò sul grano duro e sull'Italia in particolare, eh, poi farò un'escursione un eh, negli altri principali paesi del mondo, giusto perché per poter tirare delle conclusioni circa i prezzi prevedibili bisogna anche vedere cosa succede eh, negli altri paesi importanti per, per i cereali e per il grano duro in particolare. Vado subito al, al primo capitolo. Cos'è successo, cosa sta succedendo in Italia eh, durante appunto la campagna, la campagna corrente? Cominciamo dalle superfici. Come sapete in Italia il granodur si semina in autunno e eh, possiamo dire con solidità, anche perché appunto eh, già la, le, le rilevazioni sono già state effettuate anche dalla stessa Istat, che eh, abbiamo avuto eh, nel, nel, nella campagna 2021 rispetto alla campagna precedente un incremento della superficie seminata di, de, di circa il 5%, quindi un incremento contenuto ma un piccolo incremento nelle semine di grano duro c'è stata. Ed è un incremento motivato dalla diciamo, congiuntura favorevole che si è verificata nel settembre scorso, quando gli agricoltori hanno deciso di eh, hanno deciso cosa seminare, eh, il grano duro aveva, stava, diciamo così, era su un percorso di crescita dei prezzi che lo ha reso più interessante rispetto ai, alle colture competitive. Quindi partiamo eh, con un piccolo incremento della superficie seminata, dell'ordine appunto del, del 5%. E che rese ci attendiamo? Ecco, il tema delle rese è molto complesso perché eh, anche in Italia, come in molti altri paesi del mondo, la campagna che stiamo completando non è stata semplice. Eh, le piogge sono state irregolari, eh, spesso sono presentate quando non erano opportune e sono mancate quando erano invece necessarie o quantomeno utili. Eh, per cui mh, oggi noi stimiamo fondamentalmente una resa molto simile a quella dello scorso anno, eh, ma onestamente eh, le difficoltà che tuttora persistono in alcune aree del paese e aree importanti per quanto riguarda il grano duro ci fanno essere molto prudenti, molto prudenti su quella che sarà la, la resa di questa campagna che comunque ecco, nella migliore delle ipotesi sarà sostanzialmente allineato o poco più di quella dello scorso anno, quindi una resa nella media, ma appunto con le incertezze derivanti da, da quello che, sta, che, che continua a non succedere con le ultime settimane. Eh, ecco, ovviamente eh, il, il ragionamento sulle rese anche è, è abbastanza omogeneo anche se lo andiamo a declinare sulle varie macro aree. In realtà appunto la situazione della... della, della cattivo andamento pluviometrico ha interessato un po' tutte le aree del paese, nord, est, sud, centro, quindi non ci sono differenze, eh, differenze sostanziali. E anche, anche qui quindi ci aspettiamo mediamente un piccolo incremento, ma fondamentalmente i dati sono molto simili a quelli dell'anno scorso e anche qui appunto c'è l'incertezza legata al cattivo andamento degli ultimi mesi. Tirando le somme, che rese ci aspettiamo? Eh, le rese che ci aspettiamo noi, che si aspetta eh, a rete, sono eh, poco al di sopra dei 4 milioni di tonnellate, quindi poco al di sopra dello scorso anno. Come vedete abbiamo messo nello stesso grafico anche le rese di IGC, che appunto prevede 4,5 milioni di tonne. Noi siamo un po' più prudenti, ne prevediamo 4,2 e comunque a questo aggiungiamo il punto interrogativo legato a, a ciò che è avvenuto negli ultimi mesi, appunto una campagna difficile dal punto di vista pluviometrico. Quindi rese che come vedete sono produzione, scusate, produzione nazionale di grano duro, che come vedete è abbastanza vicina ai 4 milioni, che è poi la media che abbiamo avuto eh, negli ultimi anni, salvo appunto i picchi eccezionali che tutti, che tutti ricordiamo. Quindi diciamo poco oltre i 4 milioni con un po' di incertezza anche. Ecco, aggiungo che per vedere un po', come dire, dare un po' di pluralismo all'informazione, all in realtà noi abbiamo confrontato tutte le altre fonti che si, si esprimono sulla produzione di grano duro e noi siamo i più prudenti. Diciamo, gli altri, eh, cominciare dai GC, ma anche altri soggetti tendono a prevedere qualcosa in più. Noi siamo prudenti, diciamo 4 e 2 e l'outlook è in realtà negativo rispetto a questo 4 e 2. Dovessimo rifarla probabilmente stamattina, forse diremo anche qualcosa di meno. Questo è il dato, dato dell'Italia. Eh, anche qui la, la, la ripartizione per macro aree, non, non ci sono differenze sostanziali, l'andamento, come ripeto, è stato abbastanza omogeneo ovunque, per cui mh, ci aspettiamo 
un po', un po in tutte le aree del paese qualcosa in più rispetto all'anno scorso ma sostanzialmente allineata con l'anno scorso questo lo dico appunto perché chi, credo sia un dato di interesse per chi organizza poi il ritiro di questo prodotto e, e, ormai, e ormai ci siamo eh, aggiungo il, il, apro il capitolo qualità apro e lo chiudo anche rapidamente perché sulla qualità se c'è qualche incertezza sulle rese e ce ne sono di sicuro e l'abbiamo appena detto e abbiamo detto anche il perché ce ne sono ce n'è ancora di più sulla qualità perché appunto questa incertezza soprattutto pluviometrica che ha, che ha caratterizzato l'intera campagna con pioggia che era troppo abbondante al tempo della semina e troppo carente durante il periodo di sviluppo della coltura eh, onestamente il tema della qualità è molto complesso ed è, eh, e, e siamo preoccupati ecco, diciamo che anche qui eh, sul tema qualitativo c'è qualche preoccupazione legata all'andamento all stagionale, è davvero difficile quindi se ci sono incertezze sulla, sulla, sulle rese finali, sulla qualità ancora di più, ancora più preoccupazione sulla qualità della, della produzione eh, e questo per quanto riguarda l'Italia. Eh, due parole sul Lazio, veramente due parole per dire che, eh, anche qua parliamo solo di grano duro ovviamente, le superfici seminate sono qualcosina in più rispetto allo scorso anno, quindi poco oltre i 40.000 40 ettari. Ci aspettiamo rese eh, leggermente maggiori rispetto allo scorso anno e quindi anche produzioni in Lazio che eh, risalgono un pochino ma veramente di poco rispetto rispetto all'anno scorso. Quindi il Lazio, diciamo, eh, leggero, in leggero miglioramento su tutti gli indicatori, quindi, quindi superfici, rese e anche, e anche produzione. Eh, qui avete la solita ripartizione, questa è una tabella che ricompare ogni anno, la solita ripartizione fra le province del, del Lazio e anche qua non ci sono grandi novità con Viterbo e Roma che si confermano di gran lunga le province più importanti con piccole variazioni, ma onestamente non particolarmente, non particolarmente significative né, né tendenziali in qualche modo. Eh, ok, eh, a questo punto chiuderei il capitolo Italia eh, e eh, mi addentrerei un attimo negli altri velocemente, eh, perché appunto i miei colleghi prima sono stati eh, brillanti ed esaustivi, per cui direi poche parole, ma mi sono indispensabili per tirare poi qualche conclusione su su cosa aspettarsi eh, per quanto concerne i prezzi. Quindi due parole sul mondo. Ovviamente sappiamo chi sono i principali player, che, eh, soprattutto i principali esportatori, l'abbiamo visto prima, quindi il Canada, il Nord America, il Canada in primis, ma anche, ma anche il Kazakistan da, da qualche anno a questa parte, sono coloro i quali fanno il mercato fondamentalmente del grano duro. Eh, che cosa sta succedendo in, uh, in questi paesi, nel mondo e in questi paesi in particolare? Eh, le superfici seminate eh, sono, uh, sono state in, uh, tendenzialmente in leggero aumento e ci aspettiamo una produzione che sia qualcosina in più rispetto allo scorso anno. Quindi eh, lo, lo, lo scorso anno la produzione mondiale ci aspettiamo qui un incremento rispetto allo scorso anno di circa il 3,3%, quindi 34,8 milioni di tonnellate, questa è la produzione attesa. Eh, come dicevo prima, dovessimo ri, 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 rifare oggi queste slide, forse direi qualcosina in meno, quindi sostanzialmente una produzione che è molto in linea con, con quella dello scorso anno, quindi a livello mondiale con le differenze che abbiamo visto anche prima, quindi il Nord Africa eh, un filo in meno, l'Unione Europea un filo in più, il Canada di più, gli Stati Uniti sostanzialmente allineati, mondo nel complesso un poco più, poco più dello, dello scorso anno. Questo è quello che ci aspettiamo. Se questo è quello che ci aspettiamo a livello di produzione, cosa succede a livello di bilancio di approvvigionamento? Ecco, a livello di bilancio di approvvigionamento, al netto di tutte le incertezze legate ai consumi che qualche mio collega ha detto prima e che rimangono certamente rilevanti, ma diciamo al netto di quello ci aspettiamo che il rapporto ending stock su disappearance soprattutto in Canada e nel, nel, nel complesso Canada più Stati Uniti che è eh, l'area che ha la maggiore come dire, forza nel determinare il prezzo ci aspettiamo un rapporto che è molto simile a quello dello scorso anno lo scorso anno Rete stimava un rapporto ending stock su disappearance pare al 19,8% quest'anno lo stimiamo al 17,7% quindi molto simile un filo più teso, quindi quello che ci aspettiamo è una supply balance che sia eh, un filo più, più, più tesa rispetto allo scorso anno. Piccoli appunto, parliamo di un punto e mezzo, parliamo di una differenza piccola, però ci aspettiamo ancora 
un, un mercato piuttosto teso perché la produzione è, è stata normale, sostanzialmente normale, gli stock l'anno scorso sono stati pesantemente intaccati e quindi la produzione nuova non è stata in grado, non sarà in grado di reintegrare questi stock. Per cui di nuovo ci aspettiamo una campagna abbastanza, abbastanza tesa. Ehm, rapidamente la storia dei prezzi dell'ultimo anno. Cosa è successo nell'ultimo anno? Prendo a riferimento soprattutto Bologna, siamo partiti, con, eh, una, siamo partiti con prezzi in uscita dalla campagna precedente, con prezzi intorno ai 230-240 euro e progressivamente con una certa regolarità siamo, siamo arrivati poco sotto ai 300 euro tonnellata e oggi siamo a 256 euro tonnellata. Prendo riferimento ovviamente alla borsa Merci Bologna. E vedete nel grafico in alto a destra la linea verde 1920 con appunto questa eh, lenta ma continua risalita che ha portato i prezzi nel giro appunto di una campagna dai 240 ai 290 circa euro per, per tonnellata. Eh, questo è quello che è successo, eh, ecco chiaramente la supply balance che abbiamo visto prima eh, sì, rende questi numeri abbastanza, abbastanza coerenti. Eh, ecco, aggiungo un altro elemento importante prima di arrivare poi a formulare le previsioni. Eh, oggi con questa supply balance il prezzo del grano vive vita autonoma. Eh, come sapete il prezzo del grano del grano duro tende, diciamo così, a, a, ad appoggiarsi sul prezzo del mais e del grano tenero. Eh, lo spread rispetto a queste due colture tende a salire quando la, supply balance del, quando la supply balance del grano duro tende a essere un po' tesa. Ecco, è quello che sta succedendo ora. Vedete nel grafico, parte destra del grafico, eh, come lo spread rispetto al tenero sia salito eh, molto, eh, sia vicino, parlo sempre di Bologna, sia vicino ai 100 euro tonnellata, e questo è dovuto al fatto che appunto c'è tensione nella supply balance del, del grano duro. Quindi nonostante appunto i prezzi delle altre commodity non siano cambiati significativamente negli ultimi anni, come vedete, in realtà il grano duro è salito di sua, di sua forza, quindi facendo leva sui propri fondamentali. Ecco, eh, ovviamente eh, in Italia siamo vicini alla raccolta eh, e c'è incertezza su qualità e quantità, in Canada siamo lontani dalla raccolta e a maggior ragione, quindi c'è incertezza su qualità e quantità, per cui dobbiamo sempre ricordarci di tenere d'occhio quello che sta succedendo in questi paesi, perché oggi stiamo ragionando sulla base delle informazioni che abbiamo oggi, ma ogni giorno chiaramente ci fornisce elementi nuovi, insomma. quindi attenzione, perché in particolare, attenzione in particolare a quello che avverrà nei prossimi mesi con la raccolta nell'area del Mediterraneo e a quello che succederà poi nel prossimo agosto-settembre con la raccolta canadese. Vado all'ultimo capitolo, vado alle conclusioni eh, velocemente per dirvi che cosa? Eh, proprio tre, eh, tre highlight per, per cercare di, di darvi gli elementi da, da ricordare. Eh, ci aspettiamo eh, un, eh, un lieve incremento della produzione a livello mondiale, più 3,3%, ma eh, come dicevo prima, se dovessimo rifarla oggi forse diremmo eh, un po' meno. Eh, ci aspettiamo eh, stock finali, un rapporto stock finali su disappearance al 17,6% contro il 19,8% dello scorso anno. Quindi ci aspettiamo ancora un eh, lieve incremento della tensione sul, 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 sul mercato del, del, del grano duro. Ci sono ancora dei fattori di incertezza, che sono le rese in Italia, come dicevo prima, eh, e sono anche l'avanzamento delle semine e le rese che avremo finali in Canada e negli Stati Uniti. Eh, questo è il, eh, il quadro. Quindi, mh, per cercare di fare la sintesi della sintesi, eh, ci aspetta una campagna a grano duro 2021, dove appunto continueremo ad avere, eh, ad avere i prezzi un, un, pochino, un pochino tesi. Peraltro va detto, eh, va detto che eh, i dati che abbiamo visto prima sulle dinamiche delle superfici in tante aree del mondo dimostrano come i prezzi che abbiamo registrato negli ultimi anni non siano sufficienti probabilmente ad alimentare adeguatamente la filiera del grano duro, perché eh, se appunto le principali aree del mondo tendono a essere in flessione, a fronte di prezzi che sono stati fondamentalmente stabili o abbastanza allineati per alcuni anni, è chiaro che eh, come dire, 
eh, abbiamo bisogno di qualche euro in più probabilmente per mantenere in equilibrio eh, quel mercato. Qualche euro in più che adesso c'è e, eh, e, e che appunto ha, ha, è stata la conseguenza di qualche anno di, eh, di, eh, di difficoltà e di prezzi, di prezzi bassi, unitamente anche a campagne che non sono state particolarmente brillanti e fortunate dal punto di vista della resa. Eh, vi ringrazio dell'attenzione, ringrazio di nuovo in particolare Valentina per, per l'invito e spero, mi fa molto piacere che i, i, Roma, Cereale, Roma Cereale abbia tenuto duro anche in questo, in questo anno difficile e spero proprio che il prossimo anno ci si possa ritrovare tutti al Tempio di Adriano e, e, la, e salutarci e, e tornare a lavorare come, come si deve. Grazie Ma di nuovo. Grazie, grazie a te Mauro, sì, tornare a lavorare come siamo abituati a fare, tornare a guardarci eh, negli occhi, questa è la cosa più importante, la dimensione umana, lasciatemi eh, dire in conclusione che... Ehm, Grazie, grazie a tutti voi, grazie alle tante imprese che ci stanno seguendo, non solo per l'attenzione e, e l'affetto che ci riservano, ma anche qui mi spoglio del ruolo tecnico e mi metto dalla parte così della, de, del consumatore, della persona eh, che ha vissuto un'esperienza pesante e dobbiamo sempre dire grazie, grazie alle imprese del settore eh, agroalimentare che hanno lavorato con turni massacranti e che hanno garantito il costante approvvigionamento eh, alimentare e hanno rappresentato un segnale importante di stabilità eh, sociale quindi credo che un grazie sia doveroso a, anche a, in questo senso alla platea eh, di chi eh, assiste eh, oggi a Roma Cereali grazie a tutti voi volevo solo dare qualche altra annotazione tecnica allora rilasceremo eh, già tra domani e dopodomani il report conclusivo con i contenuti di questa giornata ringrazio anche eh, Ismea che tra l'altro ha fatto eh, un intervento interessante focus mensile sui consumi alimentari proprio in questo periodo eh, di emergenza. Grazie sempre a Borsa Merci Telematica Italiana con la quale collaboriamo stabilmente anche in occasione delle eh, sedute settimanali di Borsa Merci. Mm, prima della chiusura vi comparirà sullo schermo un questionario di soddisfazione cliente. Se lo compilate sono solo tre domande, ci aiutate eh, ad offrirvi un servizio sempre migliore e infine eh, giusto un paio di giorni per mettere a punto dei dettagli tecnici e poi la registrazione di questa giornata sarà postata sul canale YouTube di Agrocamera quindi per chi non avesse potuto assistere alla diretta di oggi ci sarà modo eh, per tornare sui contenuti e rivedere registrati i nostri eh, bravissimi relatori. Grazie, grazie a tutti e un arrivederci alla prossima edizione di Roma Cereali.